How was that for you, being the wife of someone who's bang at it still? It was a life that I'd never seen. We got married while he was in Wandsworth Prison. You got married while he was in the prison? Took me out another time, and that's when I met Reggie Gray. I was sort of so in this bubble yeah. that I didn't think past that bubble until in 1978, my husband went on a robbery, and he said to me, I really, really don't want to go. So I said, well, don't go. He said, I have to. And on that robbery, he got shot dead. And it was from that day, I changed. In his coffin on the day that he was buried, I said to him, I will take up what you were doing. I'll become the leader of the gang. And you gained a lot of respect very quickly. <laughs> yeah. I got charged with gangland murder. The tariff starts 21 years up. Reggie Cray used to write to me, and he proposed to me twice. As we walked inside my house, bang, and we turned, and there was somebody there, a big figure, in black, with a balaclava, and a sawn of shotgun. And I saw the blood coming through this jacket, and he pulled his mask up. Did you know who he was? Linda, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, really looking forward to this one, very much so. Let's roll all the way back. Where did you grow up and how did you become a, a bank robber and one of the most feared <laughs> gangsters in the UK? I grew up in Stepney in the heart of the East End. Um, I grew up very ordinary, normal family. My mum and dad were workers. My dad was a blacksmith. My mum was a market trader. I had three brothers, five sisters. Uh, at school, I was probably the most boring kid going. I never skipped school, went every day, um, left school, got a job in the um, co-op offices. Uh, just going along and my life changed when I was out one day up at the um, Whitechapel Market banged into my cousin and her husband. He, at the time, was the only criminal that I knew. He was a creeper. A creeper? To, What's a creeper? That goes into hotels and places like that and sort of these big posh houses. And he was obviously very successful. As a, you say, a creeper as in a thief? Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. So she said to me, oh, what are you doing Saturday? So I said, I'm not doing anything. So she said, right, well, you're coming out with us. So I said, am I? He said, yeah, a pal of mine's just come out of the big house, the prison. Yeah. Um, he's done eight years. He said, in that eight years, we've all met partners, whatever. And he's saying, no, I don't want no party. Like, I'm just me on my own. I'll just, just have a drink. But he said, no, we want a party. So you're perfect. Will you go? You've only got to go for the night. So I said, OK, I would. I got all ready and changed my mind. And I got a phone call from my cousin. Lynn, there's a cab on its way for you because you're embarrassing him. He said, you're coming and you've not turned up. So I'm on my way going, oh, God, he's going to be right ugly. For some reason, I thought, like all the films, all the crooks that have got the broken noses and whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I just thought, I'm going to see this right thug. And he, at the same time, was thinking, well, I'm glad she's not turned up. What 19-year-old hasn't got a boyfriend on a Saturday night? She's got to be a dog. <laughs> so <laughs> we're both Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then as I've walked in the pub, George has gone, Lynn, walk over. I've walked over, he went, Linda, Mickey, Mickey, Linda. And that was it. And I ended up marrying him. Wow. And what did he get banged up for? Um, an arm robbery okay. in Stratford. It was Marks and Spencer's security ban. Mm. He was only 20 and with his friends. They got caught and they all got eight years. Yeah. And he was in Dartmoor and that was in the days when prison was proper prison. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He'd done, over the time he was away, um, he'd done 18 months in total because he used to, keep note of the days mm. that he did in the block. And when you were in the block in those days, you got bread and water. So he said, in that all that time, I had 18 months of bread and water, which people no. wouldn't believe it mm. nowadays. 
So what? So what, how did your life change then? Obviously, you've come out. You've met a criminal. Were you in that criminal world? Did you know many criminals before? No, from that one. No, yeah. only George. Yeah. Um, they took me out another time, and that's when I met Reggie Cray. But just sort of not to say oh, I knew Reggie yeah. Cray well, but um, met Reg. And he come up and said to George, oh, who's this then? She looks very refreshing. Mm. And I thought that's a polite way of saying I'm the only one that's not dripping in diamonds <laughs> and whatever, because I was an ordinary girl. Yeah. Um, and he held my hand and went, lovely to meet you. Mm. Now, many years later, I got involved with Reg again. But we get to that as yeah, well for Daniel's story. So when you were 19 there, you, he's come out of Nick now. Was he still active when he come out? Not for the first few months, yeah. but he did soon get back into okay. it. Okay. And how was that for you being the wife of someone who's bang at it still? Did you get addicted um, to that? Did you enjoy that buzz? Well, I suppose, I, yeah, I was only, what, 20. Yeah. And... It was a life that I'd never seen, mm. ever. Totally, it was so exciting, mm. as opposed to sort of everybody else I knew, got up, went to work, come home. These were, to me, really exciting guys. Mm. And when Mickey had never learned to drive, they used to come to, to our house and sit and plan the robberies in our house. So I was sort of... <laughs> or what's happening yeah, and yeah. I sort of listened from the periphery and made teas and coffees and sandwiches and um, I sort of gradually I, I would go with him and he'd say well drive around I want to see some outs for when we do whatever not just you have to plan a robbery thinking you're going to get caught yep. not that you're not going to get caught mm. Because then you've got to have two, three different yeah. outs. And you'd look for something like a loose board on, in a fence that you can go through, mm. or a dead end, or somewhere with a bollard where a car can't go through, but mm. you can have a motorbike. So it, it's quite a lot. A, a robbery itself literally takes a couple of minutes, mm. but the planning sometimes takes months. Mm. So, as I say, he didn't drive, so I would drive him. And I, so I got involved that way, but never actually did anything. And then he went away, he got three years. So he got three years again, did he, while you were yeah, still married to him? Yes. For armed robberies? No, not for armed robberies. Um, that was for um, robbing premises. Okay. And um, he, we'd got, he went into, it was really audacious, really. Um, one of his friends was a key man and they robbed a department store and what they did, they went in a couple of days before and walked round and decided all what they wanted, sofas, beds, mm. all the furniture, put a little mark on everything. And on the Saturday night when the store was closed, his friend opened the store up, switched the alarm off, they all went in got the keys, put the brown overalls on, loaded up the furniture van, delivered all the furniture to all our houses, went back, put the van back, locked it up, locked the shop up and went. So obviously they said had to be an inside job, yeah. but it, it wasn't. Mm. Um, but he was at that time working with Charlie Lowe, mm. who ended up being a super grass. And Mickey, the only thing he actually got done for was this department mm. store. And that's he got his three years for. And we got married while he was in Wandsworth Prison. You got married while he was in the prison? Yeah. How on earth do you get married when he's in a prison? No, they brought him out to Wandsworth Registry Did Office. Did they? Yeah. Wow. But somebody had phoned the prison and said it's, uh, it's an escape attempt. And he went, what are you talking about? An escape attempt. I'm only doing three years. Yeah. But they rerouted once with one-way system <laughs> to take him the totally opposite way round. Rushed us in. We got married and they just said, right, get back to the prison, have a quick visit. 
So that was my first wedding. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What was it what was it like for you when he got put away? What what how did your world um, change? Did you take any reins or did you work no, with any not of the that time? No, okay. not at that time. And he wasn't away for a long time. Yeah. So that was fine. Um then he came home. We'd already got a daughter. When he came home, we had our son. And then he went back to doing the armed robberies. Mm. And I sort of went back on that role, that driving him around and looking. And I was sort of gradually going, looking over their shoulders and going, if you go down there, if you looked at... And I gradually yeah. was sort of creeping in on things. Yeah. And my mum had a wig stall. And... I used to get disguises from my mum's stall for them. So they'd have sort of Afro wigs or moustaches yeah. or whatever to sort of dress them up. Got stage makeup, I'd do scars and different things. Um, and as I say, it was like, it wasn't real to me. Mm. It, this was like, sounds very naive, mm. but it was, it was like a, I was sort of so in this bubble yeah. that I didn't think past that bubble mm. until um, in 1978, my husband went on a robbery and they went, they went the first week and they missed it. So they said, we're going back next week, which I knew they didn't ever like to do. Mm. He went back the following week, come back, he went, they want to go again next week. And he said to me, I really, really don't want to go. So I said, well, don't go. He said, I have to, I can't not go. And on that robbery, he got shot dead. No. Yeah. What, running away? Going he was into running the... away and he was shot through the back. By the old Bill? Yeah. So in 1978, was that the time when the police were allowed to shoot bank robbers, etc.? Well, I'll fill you in on this yeah. because um, the night before, because it was outside a supermarket in South London, and he said, I'm not going to have anything in my gun. He had a sawn-off shotgun, and he sat at the kitchen table, and he took the cartridges, and he took the ends off, and he emptied everything out, and he just put wadding in. So it's just fluff in there. Yeah. And he sealed it back up. So he said, if it comes to it, that I've got to sort of fire it for effect, all that's going to come out is fluff. I know I can't hurt anybody. Yeah. Um, so I knew that. Mm. So the next day when he went on this robbery and he didn't come home and I was thinking, oh, what's happened, what's happened? We were going out with a friend and he turned up and I said, he's not come home. So he said, or oh, maybe he's got away with it. He said, and he's celebrating. We go out and we'll see if we can find him. And even though I wasn't sure, but I went, okay, we'll go. So I missed the police knocking at my door. And we were looking for him. And we went into one pub and said, oh, it's Mickey been in. And the governor said no. And his wife walked down the stairs and went, oh, Mickey just phoned, which was a lie. Yeah. But she'd just seen on the news that somebody had been shot dead. Mm. And they knew that Mickey was doing something that day. So she said, uh, he said, stay here and he'll get, get here when he can. So I went, well, this isn't really good. We've got his friends and blah, blah, blah. Was, so she went, I don't know. He just said he, he'll come at the end of the night. At the end of the night, no Mickey. And she said, oh, I'm going to come home with you. So I said, well, you can't come home with me. Saturday, Sunday's your busiest mm. day. Don't worry about that. She said, I'm coming home. So she come back to my house. And six o'clock in the morning, um, Mickey's brother Terry phoned me. Well, it, she picked the phone up. And she said, oh, Mickey's been nicked. We've got to go to Terry's and you've got to go and see if you can get him out of the station. So I said, right. So I started getting a bag together. She went, leave the bag. You don't need the bag. You just mm. go. So we went to Poplar, went into my, went in the flats, 
and his flat, as you walked in, there was a little bit and then a long corridor and at the end was the lounge. And as I turned the corner, I thought, what's my mum doing here? Mm, okay. So I said, mum, what are you doing here? By then I'm in the, mm. the lounge. And Terry said to me, Mickey's dead. And all I could hear was somebody screaming. And I could hear somebody going, slap her around the face, she's hysterical. And I was thinking, slap her around the face, she's hysterical. Mm. Who's screaming? Mm. Didn't realise yeah. it was me. Yeah. Anyway, they said, give her a brandy, give her a brandy. He drank the brandy. And he said, Linda, we've got to go over to South London and we've got to identify him so we can get his body. And you're next to kin, you're his wife, so mm. you've got to do it. Anyway, we went over to South London and while we were waiting by the glass, waiting for the body to be brought over, there was a policeman standing here with a clipboard thing and he's gone, uh, if you'd like to sign, then you can take the body. But then he started saying, um, we've, it's very unfortunate, he said, Apparently, your husband faced the officer and said, it's me or you. As soon as he said that, I knew it was a lie. Yeah. Because they have live bullets. Yeah. Mickey had fluff. Yeah. Nobody would face somebody and go, it's me or you. Mm. So with that, I threw his board on the floor and I went, it's a lie. He was shot through the back. And he went, no, 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 he wasn't. I said, yes, he was. So I said, I'm not signing. And Terry went, Lynn, sign it, sign it. I want my brother out of here. And I said, Terry, they've killed him. They can't do any more. I'm not signing. As we went out, Terry went, and I then told him the story. And he went, oh, I'm glad you didn't do it. He said, right, we'll get, we we'll see a solicitor. We get an autopsy. So we've gone to our solicitors and got the top person in the com in the country at the time. And he said, yes, he would take it on and he would do the autopsy. And he contacted the police and the police said, we've lost the body. They lost the body? Yes. There's more to come. It gets worse. So we had to go to court to ask for a writ of habeas corpus, which is to return the body, which is normally sort of generally for, I want my car back or yeah. I want these pa this paperwork. Yeah. And the judge said, I never believed I would ever be asked to do a, a writ of habeas corpus to actually return a body. So where was, where was the body then? Well, they said he gave the police 48 hours to find the body. And obviously then 48 hours, the body was there. And he did the autopsy and said the opposite of the police's one, the police's autopsy said he was shot through the front and the bullet come out the back. The last thing I think they expected was me to say, yeah. no, mm. he was shot through the back because I knew about the cartridges. Mm. And our autopsy report stated the complete opposite. Mm. But from that, um, his brother Terry then was given information by a um, high-ranking police officer from the station. And he was told it wasn't a red eye. The guy that had the gun had got the gun out. He'd run out of time. It should have been back in the station. He'd been in the pub drinking and he was off duty. He said, but they're going to cover everything up, so I'll tell you all the things you need. And he said we needed the gun book, the day roster, etc. But um, one thing had had a cup of tea poured over it, so it was not legible, mm -hmm. you couldn't mm -hmm. say. Um, they sort of covered everything up. And it was from that day that I think I changed. 
Because until then, I wouldn't have walked in a shop and gone, pick a sweet up. Yeah. But now I've become this woman that I've got to, I've got to revenge him yeah. and I've got to do what he died doing. Mm. And in his coffin on the day that he was going to be buried, I held his toes and I said to him, I will take up what you were doing. I'll become the leader of the gang. Is that right? And I look back now and I think, <laughs> was that me? Yeah, 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 yeah. I totally changed. Yeah. And how completely. old were you here then? Mid twenties? I was thirty. You're thirty. And I totally, totally become this there, there was it was just, no, I'm gonna do I'm gonna be an arm robber, I'm gonna do this. And I got the gang. I had I took over from Mickey and I become the gang leader. And you gained a lot of respect very quickly. <laughs> yeah, I did. Did you enjoy that? When you changed, did you were like, you know what, I'm enjoying this? I actually did. Yeah. And I was really audacious. Really <laughs> audacious. Give me an example how audacious you were. I mean, I, there was one time um, when I'd got the money put in a shopping trolley and I said, drop me off. And I put, little bit of shopping on the top and I walked back to where we'd done the robbery and I was standing there with the money in the bag in my shopping trolley with bread and potatoes on top going oh my god what's happened that is <laughs> ballsy people, <laughs> people were saying oh it's terrible they're just <laughs> I was going, oh, my God. <laughs> so I used to do things. I don't know why I yeah. used to do these you could. things. Because I could. Because you could. What, give me, give, could you remember your first armed robbery? Yes. Where were you? I was in um, Hornchurch. And I was the driver. And it was sort of... I was quite excited. It, it was weird. It's as if I wasn't walking on the ground. Mm. I was so, you know, it's, it's such a weird feeling. Did you know what the conse consequences would be being a driver at that time compared to going in and doing a job yourself? Yes. Yeah. Wouldn't have been quite as bad. Yeah. But then I did take over and I had a gun. What was it like <laughs> the first time you held a sawn off shotgun to go and do a robbery? But I don't think I breathed. <laughs> I really don't. I don't think I breathed. What was the feeling like when you got that sawn-off shotgun in your hand for that first time? It was just, there was nothing else there. Just, this is what you've got to do. This is it. That's your focus. Mm. And you're just so focused on what you do. And then the elation afterwards, mm. it's like... <laughs> <laughs> when you're going in to do a job, what's going through your head? Nothing, just what I used to do, I used to think, I've got to think, that's my money and I want it back. Mm. But we only ever did post offices or banks because my logic was post offices and banks, that's nobody's private yeah. money yeah. and they're insured. Yeah. So we take the money, the insurance have to pay them back. Yeah. And I never looked past that. Never looked past that. What sort of what sort of bank robber were you? You going in there screaming and shouting? How did you? How I know. I on never. The people? I actually never spoke hmm. because then they'd know it was a woman. Yeah. So I never spoke. I was the silent one. So I <laughs> and I know I'm laughing, and people will probably yeah. go bloody bitch. Yeah. But when I got caught. And I had a gun sort of here over my eye when I was on the floor and there was this gun. And I suddenly thought, my God, this is horrendous. And I changed. Again? Yeah. Okay. Because suddenly it, it changed totally. Yeah. And I realised the effect that I'd had on people that whereas instead of looking just to get the money, get the money, to me, People weren't real. Yeah. But when that happened to me, suddenly, as quick as I changed the day I was told Nikki was shot dead, yeah. to that day, I it changed. Okay. I totally, be and I thought, 
oh my God, what have I been doing? Yeah. This is horrendous. And I said, from this day, I will never, ever, ever steal a thing. Mm. And I felt real remorse for the sort of, the shock that it caused people. Mm. And the reality really sunk home. Mm. And I totally changed. How long, how many years were you at it before you got caught? Um, About two or three. Two or three. And then I got seven years. So you got, when you got caught, you got a seven, did you? Yeah. Where were you when you got caught? What happened that day? Um, well, what actually happened this day, I'd only had to go down because um, it was local to where I was. Where was it? This was in Stepney. Okay. And all I had to do was do the phone call to say it's pulling up and go back into my flat because I was known down there. Mm. But we'd been watched so when they arrested them, they arrested me. And that was it. I got seven years. Bloody hell. You- but my gang, I have to say, were fantastic. And they said to the police, look, we don't want her to go away. Mm. Her husband got shot dead. She's got two kids, blah, blah, blah. What can we do? So they, they had a deal and said, if we clear out your books, because we were so prolific, there were so many robberies. He said, if we clear our books, can you drop her down lower and lower and lower? Till in the end, they said, yeah, we'll do that. They cleared 21 robberies up for them. So for that, and they were also given some money. They then said, we will say she was Far from being the main person, we say she was somebody. They said, say we used her, we made her do it. Yeah. And they was like, so yeah. they said, we'll do that. I never did a day on remand. And when I went, appeared in the uh, magistrates, and the magistrates said, of course, you will be asking for custodial. They said, no, she's a widow with two small children. We think she should have bail, no money, don't need to hold her passport. But it was, everything was, they they made it easier for you. Yeah. They they done that. They said, yeah. "Yeah." And they said to me, we hope you realize what they're doing for you. They've, they've given their lives away for you. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I know they are. How many were there in the gang? The day we were called, there was only two others. Yeah. And the day you weren't called, was there a, how many was there in your oh, game? Oh, we would have up to, there was seven in all, but not all on the same thing because yeah. different people were good at different things. Mm. So you might have three people one day, two another, mm. but they all sort of had their speci- specialities. Mm. What was your speciality in bank robbing? <laughs> I think the planning. The planning. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever think... Like you're an East End girl. Did you ever think getting out of East End and doing robberies in other places, not on your doorstep? I did move out. I yeah, moved okay. to Essex. Um, and we did do them in Essex as well. Yeah. So. What do you reckon, how many years do you reckon you would have got if the if the lads hadn't have backed you? You got a seven. How many do you reckon got, you got? I probably would have got 15 or 16. Oh. Because they got 21. Did they? Yeah. So. Are they still alive? No, they've both died oh, since. Okay. Yeah. What are their names? Brian Thorogood and mm. Carl Gibney. Wow. Yeah, they both have died. What was it like for you, like this whole picture of innocent girl meeting a bank robber, your husband getting shot, you taking the reins of the gang, mm-hmm. you, you did extremely well in that two, three year period. What was it like for you to go to prison all of a sudden? Well, it was a culture shock. Mm. A real, as in the book that I've yeah. got for you here, yeah, you'll lovely. see it was a real culture shock. I mean, I'd visited prisons, yeah. but it's totally different being Very, in one. It's nice because you walk out and wave goodbye, <laughs> can't you? Yeah. <laughs> it's still <laughs> not nice visiting time, either. <laughs> at the time I got seven years, um, I had, other than the people in the prison that had life, I had the biggest prison sentence because going back then, women never got big sentences. Yeah. 
Did they not? No. Okay. Women never got big sentences. Okay. They were still looked on as sort of victims and they they never got big sentences. Mm. So for me to get seven years, I had the biggest sentence in Holloway other than a couple of women that were doing life. Wow. And what was Holloway like? Where's Holloway in the country? Well, they pulled it down now, but Holloway is in Holloway. In Holloway, okay. Yeah. And what was it like, if you can explain to the listeners, what it's like being in a, a woman's prison? Well, it's horrible. Mm. It is horrible. Um, it is a culture shock. My, when I first arrived, um, well, I was in the dock when the judge said, no, I'm going to sentence her now. It was the first time I had a screw next to me. And he said, far from her, being the small cog that everybody, including the police, have tried to portray her as, I think she was the machine. And I thought, how does he know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he said, and I would like to have given you 21 years today, but it would be pointless because you would win, win your appeal. He says, so I'm going to give you seven years and hope that you don't get any time off of that. And as he said that, the screw next to me went, fucking hell. And I thought, why is she sitting like that? <laughs> and then when we got took downstairs and there was another screw sitting knitting and she went, how she get on? And she went, she got seven years. And she went, fucking hell. <laughs> and I'm like thinking, well, why are they so yeah. shocked? Yeah, 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 yeah. She went, you got the biggest sentence in Holloway. How are you going to do it? I said, well, I've done the time, I'll, the crime, I'll have to do the time. And uh, the day, from the day I walked in there, they said to me, oh, how are you going to do it? I said, well, I'll have to do it. I mm. did it. And they went, You've, everyone says they didn't do it. Mm. I said, well, I did do it. And it wasn't nice. It was horrible. How and long did you do in total? For that, I did um, just under four years. Yes. And how old were your kids when you went in? My kids were only young. Um, Roughly, what sort of age? My son was about 12. My daughter was 16. Yeah. That heartbreaking. Mm. Mm. And they said, why did you do it, Mum? We only wanted you. Mm. We didn't want what you give us. And that sort of really hit home because I just thought, they can have what they want. They yeah. can have anything. And when they said, we didn't want anything, we just wanted Joe. Oh, mate. Yeah. But then after that, I said, listen, I'm going straight. I'd learned a trade when I went to the open prison. So roughly what year did you come out of that first, after doing four years of that oh, arm robbery? 19... It's all in the book, all my dates. Is it right? We're we talking late 80s here. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And when you come out, what was your attitude when you come out? You want to go straight? And... Oh, no, I was going straight. Yeah. I, I learned a trade when I was um, in the open prison. And I did soft furnishings. And I got a city and guilds distinction. And one of my sisters, we said, oh, we start up a, a business doing high-end curtains. And she said to me, oh, I've got loads of orders already before you're home. And I was doing really, really well, successful. Um, I was still visiting prison because my then boyfriend was, was in prison, Ronnie Cook. So you, when you come out of prison, you got a new boyfriend, Ronnie no, Cook. No, I already had him. So you were when you went to prison, yeah. your boyfriend was Ronnie Cook? Yeah, but he was in prison already himself. He was an arm robber. Right. <laughs> you couldn't write this. This is amazing. I did well, write you did it. write it. That's I why we talk about the book, Life Inside. We're coming to that, Linda. So you were, you, he was in prison while you were boyfriend and girlfriend. You went into prison. You're still yeah. boyfriend and girlfriend. You come out and he was still in Nick. He was still in prison. Okay. How long were you out for before he came out? Um, about 18 months. Okay. And what happened? I was home. I'd been and picked him up from Maidstone Prison. And we got to my home. 
we came in, as we walked inside my house, there was bang, really loud bang. And we turned and there was somebody there, a big figure in black with a balaclava and a sawn off shotgun. And he said in an Irish accent, get down on place. And Ron went, what's up, mate? And he went, bang. And I saw the blood coming. The jacket he had on was this sort of colour. Mm. And I saw the blood coming through this jacket. And I screamed and bent down in the corner. And then I heard the second shot. But before the second shot was fired, I heard, this one's for Mickey Calvey. Bang. And I turned my face and he pulled his mask up and went, you'll be all right. And he ran out. And it was a friend of Brian Thorogood's, Danny Reese. And he ran out. And I'm now here. This Ron's dead on the floor. And I've run out and I'm screaming. And there was a young policeman walking along and he come running over. And I went, he ran in my house, come out. He put his arm around my shoulder and he went, it's 12.28, it's the murder. That murder had literally happened two minutes. It had to be the freshest murder scene you could ever get. And within 10 minutes, you can imagine there was absolutely loads and loads of cars. And they've said, tell us what happened. So I've said, what happened? I said, guy come in, blah, blah, blah. But I never named him because I thought, you said, this one's for Mickey Calvey. So I never named who he was. Did you know who he was? Yes. He was a friend of Brian Thorogood's. And I never named him, but I said exactly what happened. And they said, okay, we know you're a witness to the murder. We'll take you in. We need your clothes. We can see the blood is down your back, etc." So I went to the police station and while I was in there, they took me upstairs. They said, we don't want to put you in one of our suits. Have you got somebody that can bring some clothes up for you so we can take those clothes? I said, yes. So they phoned my elder brother and he brought, He said, I'll be about an hour where I've got to go home to my wife, get some clothes from her and bring them back. And in that hour, they said, um, we can eliminate you right now. So I said, yeah, please do. I was no more aware of that happening but until it actually happened. Mm. And I thought, I can't say... It was Danny Reese. Mm. I can't say it. But I told them exactly what happened. And um, they came in. They said, we can do some uh, tests on you to prove whether you fired the gun or whether you didn't. So they were they were accusing you of... No, they weren't. They were offering to eliminate me. Right, okay. So I said, please eliminate me. I didn't do it. I was n no... No more aware yeah. of it was going to happen till it, till it happened. So they came in with a little tray and he swabbed my hands, swabbed my face. And he said, have you got a new hand case? I said, I've only got tissues. So one of the officers went like that and held his hand out and he had a, a hanky on his hand with a blue initial, but I didn't see what the initial was, but you know, the sort of old fashioned yeah. ones. So he said, I haven't used it, it's clean. And he said to him, you won't get it back. I can remember every word mm. of what happened. So he said, she's welcome. So I got the hanky, the <sighs> blowing into this hanky, took it. They came back about 20 minutes later and he says, the best thing you, you could have done, you're totally eliminated. We know you, you are purely a mm. witness. Um, five minutes later, my brother turned up with my clothes went home. Uh, following week, they said, we've arrested Danny Reese for the murder. So I said, right. They said, well, 
did you know? I said, no. I didn't say we pulled his mask yeah. off and said, this one's for Mickey Calvert. Mm. Um, you just kept stum, did you? Yeah. Okay. So I said, okay. So then, we, do you know? I said, yes, I do know he is. He's a friend of Brian Thorogood's. So they said, well, we've charged him. Well, then they said, you didn't tell us you were Linda Calvey. So I said, of course I did. It's on my statement. Mm. You didn't tell us you were Linda Calvey that caused all that fuss when your husband got shot. So I said, what difference does that make? All the difference in the world, you're now our suspect. So I said, well, how can I be your suspect? You've eliminated mm. me. Did we? And how did we do that then? I said, well, you know what you did. Mm. You've done the swabs, you've done the mm. hanky. No, none of us remember that. We're charging you with the murder. You're joking me. They said, this is our scenario. Danny Reese fired the first shot. He couldn't kill him. So you took the gun and you killed him. We're charging you with a murder. I said, but you know it's a lie. You know it's not true. They went, that's what we're charging you with. And I got charged with killing Ron Cook. So what about that for a twist? Jeez. How long did this go on for then? Well, I was immediately then arrested. What was um, your attitude at the time? Were you screaming well, and shouting? Of course I mean, it's nothing to do with me. Yeah. 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 I mean, if he'd not have pulled his mask out, you wouldn't have known. I wouldn't have known it yeah. was him. But I think he just thought I let her know she's all right because I was screaming. Does he think he was doing you a favour? Well, I after afterwards I found out that. Brian Thorogood, who was part of your gang, the original yes, bankroll, yeah, was really good friends with Ron. And Ron had told Brian, I locked him out of the car. I wanted his wife. I thought, I didn't think he'd get killed. I thought he'd get a 10 stretch and I could have got myself up, put my feet under the door. And he went, you got a guy killed because you wanted his wife. He went, yeah. Well, Brian never told me. Mm. He told Danny. Mm. And he said to Danny, I should have killed him for doing that. That's so terrible. And Danny went, I'll kill him. I'll do it. So although he'd never met Ron, he did that for Brian. Right, OK. So he went and done that job. Yeah, he came in and killed Ron. Yeah. Because Brian had told him right. that he'd locked him out of the car, Mickey out of the car. And he said, I should have killed him when he told me that. And Danny was a young hothead and he went, I'll do it. I don't care. So, how did you deal with that knowing you know he's pulled up his mask with an Irish accent? I know it's you, Danny. How did you then deal with it? He said, hold on a minute, Dan, you need, you need to own up this. I've got nothing to do with this. How did that pan out? He said to me, when we got both got charged, he went, tell him it was me. What, Danny said, tell him it was me? Yeah, I said, how can I tell him it was you? I can't cross you up. I can't say it was you. Even though you know you're going to get a massive sentence? So I said, look, I didn't do it. I believe that I will get found not guilty. He went, OK. And he never ever said it. He never said it was him. Did he have an opportunity to say it was him? Well, he could have, but he didn't. But he said to me, say it was me. And I went, I can't say it was you. I can't, I can't say it. And is that pure morals of I yeah, can't cross someone up, yeah. mention any names? Yeah. OK. And I really believed that I would get a not guilty. What did they find evidence that you, they think it they was you? They had no evidence. Where was the gun left? Was the gun left on no, the scene? Where never, did they find the they gun? They never found the gun. They never found the gun. So there's no prints on the gun? In the in the Old Bailey, the forensics evidence, uh, evidence mm. that they said, oh, she fired the second shot, she killed him. And the for forensic officer said... The only way she could have killed him is if her arms was eight foot long. Mm. He said, and she's got no different length arms to anybody else. Mm. 
she could not have possibly got, committed this murder. How did they? How can they prove that you that they're trying to put on you that you pulled the trigger if the gun is not nowhere near the scene? Exactly, but they hid the evidence, proving I never. Mm. They hid their own evidence. And what evidence did they have on you? They had no no evidence. So do you think the well, old boy? What they just, said. Um, you know the point you said a minute ago. You said, "Oh, you're Linda Calvey." The, yeah. That played a big part in yes, this, right? Yes, it did. It did. Mm. And if I hadn't have been Linda, Linda Calvey, yeah. the, the armed robber, yeah. I would never have got charged with that murder. Why do you think they wanted to put you away? Because of all the, what do you say, for, for the stink that I kicked up when I had said he, he shot was through shot back. through the back. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And I think they probably said he would have signed it. She said no. Mm. It's down to her. So they want to. And get I their, think they want to get their they, own back. Yeah. Okay. I think they wanted to get their own back on me. For that. Did you ever see Danny Reese at all? When you got nicked to see him eye to eye, I said, "Hold on a minute, mate. You need to own up to this." Only when on legal visits, because he was locked up. I was locked up. Okay. Yeah. I never knew D Danny out of prison. I'd never knew him before. Never you just knew, knew the name? No, I'd actually met him on visits when I visited Brian. Yeah, okay. But I never knew him out of prison. How long did this case go on for before you were in the dock? You trying to prove your innocence, then putting you in... Yeah, about three weeks. Was it? And everybody was, everyone was lying. Everyone was lying. I was the only one who told the truth. And Danny never gave evidence. That's odd, isn't it? Mm. Did Danny, how long did Danny get for this? He got 15 years. When they come back and said guilty. How many years did you get for this, Linda? I was just going to say. Yeah. I got charged with gangland murder. Gangland murder, the tariff starts 21 years up. So they said to me, we're not expecting you to get a guilty, Linda. But, you know, putting gangland in front mm. is 21 years. So when the judge said, when they came back and said guilty, the judge said, I'm going to do the sentence in front of this jury. And he put the black cap on top of his head. And unlike the judge, when I got my seven years, mm. who really coated me and mm. said, blah, 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 mm. he put his hands out like this and went, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. All I can do is refer you straight to the full court of appeal from this doc. Do you understand what that means? Mm. I was like, he said, it means you don't have to apply for an appeal. I have granted your yeah. appeal in front of this jury. Yeah. So he was saying to that jury, you've come back with the wrong decision. And that's only the second time in legal written history that a judge has done that. Mm. And he said to me, seven years, which was the third yeah. of the minimum. So he, he knew what had happened in my case. And he gave Danny 15 years. She gave Danny 15 and gave you... Seven. Seven. How long do you do of that seven? When I got to the end of the seven... You did the whole seven? The whole seven. And I was still... I wouldn't say I committed the crime. Yeah. I didn't do it. I said, I will never, ever say I committed this crime. I didn't do it. And when I got to the end of the seven years, um, one day one of the principal officers opened the door and said to me, Linda, I've got some bad news. We were all locked in and um, I said, is it my family? We're, I'm talking through the door to him. So he said, no, it's not your family. I said, nobody in my family's died. He said, no. I said, well, whatever it is then, it can't be that bad. And he said, can I open the door? So he opened the door and he said, would you like to come to the office? So I said, no, you can just tell me. So he said, Unfortunately, the Home Office have put another eight years on top of your sentence. Your sentence is now 15 years. Oh, man. 
And you're 100% innocent. Yeah. And you're going to do 15 years in total. Yeah. And I did all of it. And I still didn't come home. And it was only when they changed it that you didn't have to admit your guilt. Somebody with a bit of sort of normal thought yeah. said, it's a human system, the jury system. We all readily agree there's guilty people get not guilties. By the same token, you've got to say innocent people get guilties. Yeah. And if an innocent person's gone to prison, you can't expect that person to say they committed the crime to go home. Yeah. So that was taken away. You didn't have to say it anymore. Oh. And that's the only reason that I came home. I did 18 years. Bloody hell. What year did you go in then? God, it's 90, I think. 90. I came home um, 2008. 18 years mm. in prison. What characters in prison did you come across? Myra Hindley, Rose West. Um, Reggie Cray used to write to me, send me flowers. Mm. I used to talk to him every week when I was in Durham. And he proposed to me twice. Reggie Cray proposed <laughs> you, did he? <laughs> but I think I would have never, ever have gone home if I'd have ended up with a surname Cray. <laughs> Um, Charlie Bronson used to propose to me <laughs> every three or four Didn't months. <laughs> yeah. What was Myra Hendley and Rose West like? Myra was horrible, totally very, very clever. Yeah. But you, you could feel the evil on her. You could. The first time I met her, I slapped her around the face. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> <laughs> Not a hello. No, but look. I didn't. I mean, it was... I didn't think, oh, I'm going to do yeah. it. I just done it without realising I'd done it. Yeah. And then I thought, no, I'm going to get sent back to Holloway now. Yeah. But I never. Um, so I met her. I met her three times over the years in various places. And Rose West I met. And she totally loopy. And at one time, Rose and Myra were in together where I was. In, I was in the men's prison in um, H-Wing in Durham. And there was one wing they had for the most sort of dangerous, the most notorious women. And to look up, you see them sitting there one day, a little red and white check tablecloth and the both of them sitting having a coffee. And one of the screws come up behind me and went, oh, I wish I had a camera. <laughs> <laughs> he went, that picture would be worth yeah. a full yeah, June. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you have to change when you were in prison? Because the moment you said when you first got nicked, when that gun was in your eye, you're going, I'm changing. I didn't know. I just did change. Just did change. But when you were in Nick, did you have to protect yourself? Did you have to well, put on a different persona? Did you have to? I suppose, strangely enough, um, my sentence what I was charged with um, is what carried me through. Yeah. Because whereas when Mickey was away and his friends were away, we were armed robbers. And in prison, they're the hierarchy. Yeah. You've got your armed robbers. And then it sort of goes down, down, down till you get sort of the- Petty thieves. Petty thieves and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. the sort of junkies yeah. and whatever. And you, but everybody go, oh, they're the armed robbers. Yeah. They get that- Kudos. Of, yeah. yeah. Well, I was the armed robber, mm. so I got that kudos. Mm. So they just presumed I was this sort of big gangster woman. Mm. And it really stood me in good stead mm. because there's so much bullying in a woman's prison. But they all wanted to be my friend. Mm. I think to think, oh, I'm friends with her. She's, yeah. she's the big armed robber. Mm. And... There's terrible bullying. I think there is in male prisons. Give me an example of the bullying in a, in a women's prison. Well, they get stuff taken off them. They, it's, I suppose, the same as men's, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you sort of see a new girl come in, she might have a packet of cigarettes, and somebody will go up and go, uh, give one of them fags, mate. Mm. 
No, she's no, she's yeah. not been associated with her. And I, to, and I think, don't do it, yeah. don't do it. Yeah. Once you give one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then two minutes later, there's somebody else, uh, gives the pack, mm. and it's till the end, they're like, well, by the time she goes, oh, I, I haven't got any spare. Mm. Oh, what's the matter with me then? Mm. And they want to like give her a dig, so she mm. go, go on then. Till, and once you're looked on as you're yeah. an easy target, you're an easy target mm. all the way through. Mm. And it's like the very first time I went in the TV room and it was all the seats were taken and some girls standing at the back. And as I walked in, a couple of girls went to one girl, get up, she's having that seat. And the girl just got up. Now, in normal life, I would go, don't do that. Yeah. But I thought, no, this is, I've got to do this. Yeah, dog eat dog, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. so I walked in and sat down and went, okay, thanks. Yeah. And I felt really bad, but... They expected me to walk in and mm. and I wanted to see it. Mm. So I suppose it did sort of do good stead for me, my actual crime. What was your mindset like in prison, No, you're not going to see your kids for a long time? It was horrible. Yeah. yeah, really horrible. Especially when I got sentenced for the murder. And... Well, they were so devastated, absolutely devastated. And I said, I didn't do this, you know, mm. I didn't do this. But they, all my whole family were absolutely, it destroyed them. So. Mm. When you came out, what was your life like when you came out of New Well, York? funnily enough, um, when I was in open prison and I was taken out, you could be p picked up and taken out. And a couple of my friends come and pick me up one day. And we went down to Headcorn and Kate Cray had a, a restaurant and a pub there. Kate Cray? Yeah. Yeah. And she said to me, oh, when you can come out for a meal, come and have a meal there. So I thought, I can go in the restaurant, can't go in the pub, can yeah. go in the restaurant. So my friends phoned up and booked it and went in. So we were sitting waiting and there was two guys sitting chatting and I'm sitting here next to one of them. And he s says to me, not at home cooking your husband's dinner. I went, no, you're not at home eating your wife's. And he went, <laughs> <laughs> he went I'm divorced. I went, so am I. So he went, yeah, I've been divorced twice. So I said, yeah, I've been divorced twice and widowed once. Like that. So he went, oh, you've beat me then. So we started chatting and he said to me, would you like to go out? <laughs> so I said, <laughs> okay. So he said, what about Friday? I went, no, I can't go out Friday. Okay, Saturday. No, I can't go out Saturday. He said, well, when can you go out? I said, I can go out Sunday lunchtime. So he said, well, why only Sunday lunchtime? So I said, because I'm in prison. So he went, shut up, you're in prison. <laughs> so I said, yeah, I'm in prison. So he said, oh, well, it can't be for anything much if you're in open prison. Yeah. So I just went, yeah, if you say so. So then he said, right, tell me the address, et cetera. He said, and I'll, uh, I'll come and get you. So I said, okay. So said to my family, don't pick me up next week. I've got a day here. <laughs> so they went, got a day. <laughs> anyway, it was late. And um, everybody had gone. And they went, oh, it's unusual for you, Linda, still standing here. So I said, yeah, it is. I said, I've got a day. I said, but I think he must have changed his mind. So I said to the girl that was sweeping, oh, if anyone pulls up, it's got to be for me. Can you shout? Mm. So she went, yeah, okay. So I'd gone back upstairs and all of a sudden she went, Lynn, has he got a red roller? <laughs> so I went, oh. So I've come down, looked out the window. There's a red Rolls Royce and he's standing there like this. And the screw next to me went, we've just took the number. If he's a crook, you're back in closed. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, he ain't a crook. And I thought, please don't be a crook. Please don't be a crook. <laughs> Anyone but a crook. <laughs> anyway, they checked him out. Yeah. He wasn't a crook. 
And um, I said to him, I can't believe you've got a red Rolls Royce. So he said, well, I've got a white one as well. He said, but I was thinking, no, come in the red one. So he said, why is that? And I said, well, there's a story. And I told him about when I was young, I was about 11. And it was in my dad's old van, he was a blacksmith. And with my mum sitting on a cushion in the middle yeah. between them, going to my aunts, and this red car pulled up, and I'm like this. So I went, one day I'm going to have a fur coat like that lady, and I'm going to have a red car like that. And my dad went, I hope you do, darling. That's a roller, a Rolls Royce. If you can afford a Rolls Royce, you'd be a rich lady. Yeah. So I told him the story. He said, Well, you got one now. So I said, oh, you're going to see me again. And we ended up getting married. Did you? <laughs> yeah. What, did you get married when you come out? Yeah. Yeah. He came to my parole hearing. Yeah. And he said, we've got engaged, he said, and this is my future wife. Quality. Yeah. How nice is that? And when we were walking out, one of the screws went, I feel it's my duty to ask you, have you thought she might kill you? <laughs> <laughs> it went, well, if she does, she does. Yeah. <laughs> what did he do for a living? He was not very popular now. He yeah. was the first man to put bleach in plastic bottles. Okay. And he had uh, a big factory that did bleach and washing mm. up liquids. And it, yeah, f yeah. very first one that ever done that. Done well for himself. Yeah. Amazing. So when you come out of prison and married George, what was your life like after that? Well, um, before I'd, I got engaged in prison yeah. to George. How did you get engaged in prison? Well, what happened, as you know, I was in open prison. Oh, okay. Um, I also had a job, but you couldn't have anybody could come and see you at work. And I worked in a little shop mm. in Headcorn called the Sustainability Shop mm. that sold fruit and whatever. And I said to him, you, you can take me out every Sunday. You cannot come in that shop. Yeah. One day he walked in the shop and went, can I have a bag of tomatoes? And I went, George, you can't be here. He said, it's all right, I'm only buying a bag of tomatoes. There was another inmate in there. I said, George, you've got to go. Anyway, he went, when I got back to the prison, I was called to the office and they said, go and pack your stuff, Linda, you're going back to closed prison. You had your boyfriend come in the shop oh, today. No. I said, I never knew. Yeah. I said he just thought he could walk in and buy a bag of tomatoes. No, you've been grassed up. You've got to go back. So I got sent back to close prison for six months for a bag of tomatoes. Oh, no. So I actually never got to see where George lived. I got engaged and we started planning the wedding. And they said, right, you can, we can let you go home for a day mm. before you go back to the closed. But we've got to go and check the place out. And they come back and the staff went, fucking hell, Lynn, it's like a hotel. She went, where you're going to live? She went, it's, a, it's like a mansion. Yeah. I went, is it? She went, oh, it's fabulous. So I knew where I was going to end up living was going to be somewhere really lovely. Wonderful. Um, I went home. Then... Married George and ended up in a lovely big house in oh, Canterbury. Really? Yeah. Lovely. How long did that relationship last for? He died. Um, he died of cancer and he's been dead seven years. So until he died. And you had a lovely, yeah. happy relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So Linda, I just want to get this straight in my head. The robbery, the bank robbery with Mickey Calvary, your husband. Yes. There was another guy in there called Ron Cook. Yes. Yeah. Mickey got shot. There was on the, the on the on the on the robbery. Yes. Who did he get shot by? He got shot by an off-duty police officer who was taking the gun back to the police station, but it shouldn't have been on his possession. Right. Um and they there was a big cover up. They changed it that it was uh police were there, it was a ready eye, it wasn't. Yeah. Um, but what happened, there was Mickey, Ron Cook, and another guy. Now, I didn't know who the other guy was. I never knew at that time it was Ron Cook in the car. Yeah. I never knew that. 
Um, but Mickey was on the robbery with them. When it came on top, Ron Cook and the other guy got in the car. Mickey ran to get in the car. The car door was locked. And there was witnesses in the street that said, Mickey shouted out, you bastard. Let me back in. Let me back in. So you think Ron Cook might have locked the door to not let Mickey back in. So roll on. That was 1978. Roll on 1990. Ron Cook come out of prison, come to your house. He got shot. And And Danny Reese. The shot was, he said, this one's for Mickey Calvey. Right, okay. Up until then, there was this Irish accent. Yeah. And... It was the door, as I say, the door was kicked open. And suddenly there's a guy there dressed all in black, black balaclava. Yeah. And he went, get down on place, but said it in an Irish accent. Mm. And Ron went, what's up, mate? And he just went, bang. And I said, I thought he was shot in the stomach because the blood was filling up the mm. front of the jacket. Um, but apparently he was shot in the arm. And then... I screamed because I thought, am I going to get killed? Mm. I don't know. And I I bent down in the corner like this. And then a Cockney voice went, this one's for Mickey Calvey. Wow. And bang. And with that, I thought, this one's for Mickey Calvey. And I looked and he went like that. And it was Danny Reese. And he went, you'll be okay. You'll be all right. Wow, and so- he ran. So the revenge that that's been gearing up for twelve <coughs> years for a revenge shooting for locking the yes. door on the getaway car. Yeah. Wow. Who were you friends with back in the day? Um, probably all the well-known faces. There was, um, well, Bobby Cummins, OBE, and uh, Freddie Foreman. Oh, he's a very good friend of mine. Um, Eddie Blundell and Billy Blundell, who's unfortunately died now, Billy. Yeah. Um, very good friends. I think all the sort of well-known names of that era, mm. I, I knew in one sort of capacity or another. Yeah, amazing. And yeah. today, let's talk about your book, Linda, The Life Inside. Yes. Tell me about this book that's being launched this week. Well, it's coming out actually on the 4th of January. You have got the first copy. Is this the first copy? That is the first. I, even I haven't got a copy. I had to go to the publishers with my agent and he said, one copy. They said, yeah, just one at the moment, but you'll be getting yours later. But they knew that I was coming on your program and they said, yes, I could have an advanced oh, copy for you. Lovely. Linda, this isn't been an... Where can people find this book? At this moment in time, you can order it on Amazon, mm. pre-order it. Once it comes out after the 4th of January, it will be in the bookshops as well. Yeah. But if anybody would like to pre-order it, it is it is on Amazon from now. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And this is also endorsed by Bobby Cummins, OBE. Yeah. And what about what's your relationship like with Martina Cole? Oh, very good. Does she base a lot of her books on your story? Well, I think we sort of come from the same world. And um, she says to me, well, you was in the the centre looking out. I was on the periphery looking in. But we both had a real good insight. I mean, Martina's books are legendary. They're fantastic. And if I can get up to her level, you're well, on the way there. I hope so. You are on the I way. Hope so. And just a thanks, a thanks to a, a mutual friend of ours, Ray Bishop, for introducing. Oh, Ray is a fabulous. Yeah, guy. he's a top man. He is a top man. Yeah. And um, I had a charity night which he attended. I do one charity night a year, and he said to me, "Linda, you've got to go and dodge with your new book." <laughs> He said, I know he'd love to have you. Yeah. So, yes, thanks, Ray, for yeah, organising Massively this. nice one, Ray. Linda, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. So have I. Yeah, this has <laughs> been a great experience. And, geez, you have lived an eventful life. I was trying to keep up with everything going on. Like, geez. <laughs> Little, if I'd have gone back in time and they just said to me, this is your life, I'd have gone, no, <laughs> no <laughs> way. But it's a chain of events. They always yeah. say consequences. Yeah. And I think looking back, had Ron 
not have locked Mickey out of the car. On that robbery. On that robbery. Yeah. Mickey probably would still be alive today. Yeah. Ron would be alive today, most yeah. likely. Because consequences, they just sort of follow. I would never have become an armed robber. No. And you wouldn't have done an 18-year stretch plus no. the seven. You wouldn't have done 25 years behind bars. Yeah. yeah. Isn't it amazing how the world can turn very quickly? I know. And people go to me, Linda, how did you manage? How did you do it? Yeah. And I went, well, because you had to. Yeah. It's sink or swim. Yeah. But I always said, I suppose, inside, because I was, oh, I'm, it was gangland murder and it was armed robbery. I was sort of up there yeah. right, in the prison hierarchy. Yeah. How corrupt are the police, do you think? I, Well, going back then, I think they were very corrupt um, at the time when Mickey died. And they were very corrupt when I got charged with the murder. And even now to this day, there is in my book, there is a poem written by a man called Jason Moore, who is fighting for his innocence. He's blatantly innocent. And December, he's served 10 years of a sentence that he, crime he never committed. And I know exactly what that feels like. Mm. And that is why I've included his poem yeah. in my book and his picture. Yeah to let people know. And Jason's not the only one. Yeah. There are other people. And unfortunately, if it's a life sentence, you, you never know when you're going to get out. Linda, it's been an absolute pleasure <laughs> to hear your story. <laughs> and I just can't picture you being in that world and stuff. You I know. know. I could picture you being in the world, but not getting it, caught well, up in everything that yeah. you've got caught up in. It's like, wow. I know. You and that's why I think so many people go... You're really gentle. Yeah. They can't associate yeah. this armed robber and this yeah. with me. With a nickname, the Black Widow. Straight away yeah. you build a picture, didn't you? But <laughs> met you today, you're an absolute star. You're, you're a very Thank kind you. human being. Thank and you. I wish you all the best with this Thank book. Thank you. Everyone out there, Linda Calvey, Life Inside, go and buy it because this will be a banger. Thank you. Cheers, Linda.